Ja, und obwohl sehr gut kommt, dann ist der Ratio der Operatio, der ist im Prinzip der PC, der der Finale der Verküstung, der Armen und Nacht und Armen. Danke, wir sind jetzt mit eurer Pranobis. And here we are already at today's topic, the Holy Mass. What happened to Mass? Now, first you have to know that the so-called Tridentine Mass, or the so-called Latin Mass, those are both uh, confusing terms because uh, there is no such thing, such thing as a Latin Mass in the, in the way it is used nowadays, and there's no such thing as a Tridentine Mass. There is only uh, the Mass right of the Catholic Latin Church. You see, the Catholic Church consists of the Latin Rite, the Ambrosian Rite, the Rite of Braga, the uh, Rite of uh, the Most Arabic Visigothic Rite, the Sarum Rite, the Primus Sotensian Rite, the Dominican Rite, and the Eastern Rite. And they all have different liturgies, even though those liturgies uh, have one thing in common. They all express the idea of the real presence of the Lord on, on the altar, and they all express the idea of the propitiatory sacrifice, that means a sacrifice not just for praise and thanksgiving, but a sacrifice for the re redemption of sin. And uh, all of these rites, go back to the Latin rite which we use, which was the original rite used by St. Peter in Rome. Not in every detail as we know it, but in many parts. Now the Roman canon, you have to understand the canon is the part of Mass between the Sanctus, Holy, 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 until Communion. The canon of Mass is something that goes back to the times of the Apostles. So it's not, not just 400 years old, it doesn't just go back to the Council of Trent, it goes back to the, to the time of the Apostles. And uh, when St. Gregory the Great, my patron saint, when he changed, he was Pope between 590 and 604, when he added the words Diesque Nostros into a Pace Disponas to the Hank Egitur of the canon, the people in Rome were outraged and they threatened to kill him because he had dared to touch liturgy. This, we're talking about the year 600, Already by then, the concept of the uh, unchangeability of the Mass had been developed. Later on, after Gregory the Great, nobody dared to add anything to the canon of Mass. Nobody dared to, any, to, add, to change anything in the proper or the order of Mass. Until Pius XII, who was not the great conservative as some people like to see him in their romantic thoughts, until Pius XII uh, ignored this tradition and had Annibale Bonini, those of you who have heard about uh, the Novus Ordo Mass and his, and their, and, and his creator, uh, have heard the name Bonini, and those of you who will read Father Trinchard's excellent book on the topic will hear about the uh, Annibale Bonini. Annibale Bonini was discovered, promoted, and made by uh, Pope Pius XII, and it is of no consequential interest to us if it was in reality his Secretary of State who did it or the Pope himself. The Pope is always responsible, no matter how. And uh, that was the first change in liturgy. The rite of Palm Sunday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday was changed. Something that did not happen in the, in the 1500 years before. Because when Pius V, with his uh, uh, everlasting document Quo Primum in 1570 canonized, that means set the rules forever, canonized the Mass that was nothing else but the Mass used by the Roman Curia and Rome, or the Diocese of Rome, he outlawed any further change, any future change. So, uh, I'll explain later why. So what Pius XII did was the beginning of the liturgical reform. The liturgical reform did not start with Paul VI of most infelicitous memory, but it started with Pius XII. Now, why is it that Mass must not change? That's very simple. The oldest liturgical rule in the Church is in Latin, lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of what has to be believed results from the law of what has to be prayed. Now when our Lord and the Sermon of the Mount said, I want you to say the Our Father, and then he said the Our Father to make us known 
uh, to make it known to us what he wanted us to say, he established a rule of prayer. Now this rule of prayer made the faith and not the other way around. We have to adjust our faith uh, to what our Lord said in the Our Father and not the other way around. We cannot take the Our Father and change it around to a new faith or to a new adaptation of the faith to the 20th century. Uh, therefore, the highest liturgical law says the liturgy is the basis of the faith. The liturgy, what the liturgy says is what you believe. So if the liturgy changes, the faith changes. Ah. Oh, good. Um, so, the faith never changes. We know that. Once the church establishes a dogma of faith, no future pope can change it. And before I go on talking about the liturgy, you have to understand the following. The pope is not infallible unless he says so, and unless he wants to be so. If the Pope prefers pea soup over a New England clam chowder, it has nothing got to do with the faith, he's not infallible. If the Pope at the Angelus Domini says that his favorite sanctuary of Our Lady is Loreto, I'm not interested. That's a personal message from a person. Unless the Pope says, I, with the authority bestowed upon me by Jesus Christ, I, as the Bishop of Rome and the Bishop of the entire Catholic Church, define, declare, and statute, I'm not interested in what he says. Unless he defines, declares, or statutes, he cannot be infallible, he cannot uh, do, pronounce an infallible truth. He does not have the necessary help of the Holy Spirit. The present Pope, for example, never did so, except maybe, and that can be doubted, maybe on the question about women's ordination, which is ob obviously excluded and always will be excluded. I don't need the present Pope to know that. But that's the only time he used that formula. So when the Pope says, for example, the present Pope, that Pro Protestants can be saved by the efforts of their own church, he's nothing but a plain, ordinary heretic, and uh, that has nothing got to do with his infallible magisterium. He has not the help of the Holy Spirit for that, and he, does not, and he did not say, I define, declare, and statue that a Protestant can be saved by the efforts of his own church. He just said it in one of his encyclicals. He said it in Catechesi Tradenda number 32. So uh, the Pope is not infallible. On the contrary, he is bound to what his predecessors decreed, statute, and defined. And only in matters that have not been settled by his predecessors, he can claim infallibility. That must be very clear to you. The Pope is bound to accept the liturgy that he receives from his predecessors. As a matter of fact, in the old uh, 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 oath of incoronation, the Indiculum Pontificis, which was first solemnly signed and, and mailed to the uh, then princes and kings and the emperor in Europe and otherwhere, otherwise, uh, in other places, this oath of incoronation uh, was the first time given by uh, Pope St. Uh, Agatha I in uh, 683, I think it was. So, uh, quite a long time ago. And this also for incoronation has been signed by every single pope until Innocent VIII, and it has been spoken by the popes ever since. And this also for incoronation, among other things, says, should we or anybody else dare to change these things, God will not be a merciful judge to us. So he's the, the pope uh, 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 at the moment of incarnation, swears an oath before God that he will not change what he has been handed over by his predecessors. In the dogma of infallibility, pronounced the 18th of July, 1870, by Pope Pius IX, the fourth chapter says, the purpose of the papacy is to guide, to, con to, uh, to watch over the doctrine, and to explain it faithfully, to interpret it faithfully. The Pope has not been given the Holy Spirit to proclaim a new doctrine. And many theologians, whom you can never quote against the Pope, but who can you, you, you can use as uh, advisors, many theologians have stated, many theologians who have been endorsed by Popes, and endorsed in their particular statements by Popes, have said, a Pope who dares to change the entire liturgy puts himself outside the church. 
Does that mean the present Pope is not Pope? No, it doesn't mean it, because the present Pope never said that he has the right to change the liturgy. He just celebrates another liturgy, which is sad, but we can't change it, and we're not interested in what he does in that sense, and in that case. So you see, the liturgy is something that cannot be changed. If the Pope or any other of the pastors dares to change it, he's wrong. And the Council of Trent, in the seventh se session, of the, in the 13th canon, says, whoever says that the, any of the pastors of the church, now that includes the Pope, doesn't it? Any of the pastors of the church. The first pastor of the church is the Pope. Whoever says that any of the pastors of the church may omit or add anything to the liturgy or uh, add, uh, change the liturgy or write up a new liturgy, he's outside the church. Whoever says so. So if anybody says the Pope has the right to change the liturgy, he's not a Catholic. That's against the defined dogma of the Council of Trent. You can look it up. Seventh session, Canon 13. Anybody who doesn't believe me can have the footnotes. So uh, the new liturgy is against divine law. The new liturgy is something that is not, it's not a work of the church. It is not opus ecclesia. It has been decreed by, it has not been decreed by Paul VI, it has been permitted by Paul VI. It has been permitted by the present Pope. It has been used by Paul VI and the present Pope against the will of God, against divine law, and against what the Council of Trent and many other popes and councils before the present ones defined, not recommended or suggested, defined and declared to be binding forever. This is not the only reason, however, why we must reject the new liturgy, the whole Novus Ordo, and its structure. This is just the, the, the reason seen from the viewpoint of divine law and natural law and eternal law. There is a reason in the new liturgy itself which will make any Catholic who sees through things refuse the new liturgy. As a matter of fact, the first reason why I decided never to celebrate the Novus Ordo again was because I found out that a Catholic priest cannot remain a Catholic celebrating this Mass. But why? Well, first of all, we have to see what is Catholic teaching on the unholy Mass. The Council of Trent defined that Mass is the unbloody repetition of the sacrifice of Calvary of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a propitiatory sacrifice and not just a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Now, Herr Dr. Martin Luther said that Mass was only thanksgiving and praise and not propitiatory, that means for the, for the forgiving of sins. Now, Herr Dr. Martin Luther is, as we know, a, a heretic and the Lutherans are heretics and the Lutherans never had Mass. The Council of Trent also defined that uh, the uh, Holy Mass is uh, offered, first of all, for the greater glory of the Blessed Trinity, then for the forgiving of the sins, and then, among other things, for thanksgiving and praise and, and, uh, and, and for thanksgiving. The first purpose is the praise of our Lord, the Blessed Trinity. The second purpose is the propitiatory aspect of Mass, the sacrifice of Christ on, the, on, on, on Mount uh, Calvary, to, uh, for, for, forgive, for the forgiveness of our sins. And the third purpose of Mass, of the, the main purposes, the third purpose of Mass is thanksgiving to God. It's not the first, it's not the second. In the new order of Mass, published, not decreed, by Paul VI of most infelicitous memory, published by him, I say published because the only decree ever on the new missal signed by the Pope is a decree that says, I like this book. I'm talking about the Constitutio Dogmatica, Missale, the Constitutio Apostolica Missale Romanum of, uh, uh, I think it was November 1970. Pope Paul VI signed that, and Pope Paul VI said he likes the book, and he adds three Eucharistical prayers to the already existing canon of Mass. So, Paul VI never said that I have to use the new missal. It was the congregation who said so. But the congregation cannot decide something behind the back of the Pope, even if the Pope afterwards silently agrees. 
This, however, is of no importance to me. The point is, here, there was a Mass, an order of Mass published that does not mention anymore the first purpose of Mass, the greater glory of the Trinity. It does not mention anymore the propitiatory sacrifice. It only mentions the sacrifice, uh, it only mentions the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. But generally speaking, praise. It doesn't mention in particular the blessed, most blessed Trinity. And it nowhere mentions the real presence of our Lord on the altar. It nowhere mentions the fact that the moment the priest in the name of Christ, in the person of Christ, pronounces the word of con words of, con of consecration, the, the body, the blood, and intimately co connected with that, the soul and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ are rendered present on the altar. Now the Lutherans believe that our Lord Jesus Christ is present only subjectively. That means uh, uh, as long as you believe it. He is present f for you in, 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 in your uh, appreciation, in your faith, in your personal interpretation of what happens. The Council of Trent says, from the moment of consecration until the particles are uh, either invisible or gone, our Lord Jesus Christ is present, replacing the substance of the bread and the wine with his own substance even though the appearance is kept. You understand that this is a very elementary part of the Catholic faith. Otherwise, we, we would be cookie worshippers. I mean, this is what you get to hear from the Protestants sometimes. Oh, the Catholics, the Papists. Then there are Papists, the cookie worshippers. Well, uh, today they are. With priests not celebrating Mass validly anymore, you get a piece of bread in the altar, you get uh, 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 sometimes uh, a priest who is not even uh, dressed for Mass behind a, a sort of ironing board saying hello to the people, saying a lot of blah blah, doing some gestures that have become meaningless, and then some people still kneel before that. Of course, that's cookie worship. But we're talking about what the Church says about Mass. And the Church says the, the body, the blood, the, 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 the soul and the divinity of Christ are present in the moment of consecration. The New Mass does not speak about that. Very cleverly, when uh, a, a group of theologians, among them a majority of Protestants, by the way, you have to understand that the New Rite was written by a majority of Protestants and not Catholics. I know that because I worked two years for Cardinal Stickler, who was member of that group. It was called the Concilium, the Council. And... Uh, I think of it, it was some nine members, uh, and uh, seven of them were Protestants. Something like that. I don't remember the exact number, but you can look it up. And uh, they wrote up a new Mass. Now, I told you before that this is not possible. That's against the will of the Church and against the will of Christ. So the Mass is illegal. But what they wrote up is even worse. It beats anything you will see in an Anglican prayer book. The Anglican, uh, what is the Anglican Missal called? The, the, the Common Prayer Book. In the Anglican Common Prayer Book, many things of the Catholic Mass are retained that you do not find in the Novus, in the Novus Ordo Missa in Latin, let alone in the English translation. When we study the infallible document, Apostolice Curae, issued by Pope Leo XIII, over the question if Anglican ministers are validly ordained priests or not. Uh, in the last century and the centuries before, many, many uh, uh, clergymen of the Anglican uh, rite and many Catholic bishops and priests discussed the question, are uh, Anglican ministers validly ordained priests? In the Catholic sense of the word validly ordained means real priests forever who are able to celebrate Mass, or are they just appointed ministers without having received the Holy Sacrament of Orders. And Leo XIII said, there are three things necessary for, ma for, for, for a valid ordination or a valid sacrament. The matter, the form, and the intention. But the matter is easy. We have to have a host on the altar, period. You can't use a cookie. You can't use a honey, uh, you can't use a bagel. And we have to have wine on the altar. It won't do with Coke. That's the, the matter of the Mass. The form is, you have to say, this is my body, at least, and this is my blood, at least. 
If the priest was to say, this is Christ's blood, forget it, it's not valid. Now the intention, the church cannot judge your intention and my intention. The church, does, the church cannot judge what you think and what you really want. But the church can judge what you manifest to want. Say, for example, in the old days when a priest walked out 6 o'clock in the morning, dead tired, but dressed nicely for Mass, walked out and said his Mass, you had the impression he wanted to do what the church does. Otherwise, why bother? Might have stayed in bed. If, on the other hand, you have a priest coming out of the sacristy dressed in jeans and sweater and uh, pays, and then he does everything, anything, everything and anything, but what you find in the Roman Missal, you will see his intention is obviously not to do what the church does. Because the church does not do that. The church uses her own liturgical books, which has got rubrics in there, which you have to follow, and they have words in there, which you have to read. So that's the intention manifested. Sometimes a priest who has the intention to do what the church does cannot do it. Like if I find myself in the jungle and there's no missile around. Absolutely no, no missile available. And no bread available, no wine. I can't celebrate Mass. Period. Sometimes a priest might have a missile, but he cannot celebrate Mass with it because the missile is the wrong missile. It might be written in Hebrew and he can't read it. Or it might be an Anglican missile. And about the Anglican common prayer book, Leo XIII said you cannot use it for a sacrament. Why? Because the Anglican Church officially says there is no sacrifice of Mass. There is no real presence of our Lord in the altar. And there is no real priesthood. So whatever they print in this book, it can't be valid. The book is determined not to celebrate Mass. It's determined to have a nice, uh, entertaining evening prayer. And uh, with the new Missal of Paul VI, the thing is in a doubtful situation. On one hand, the Catholic Church out there, this counterfeit Catholic Church, which I, what I call it, the Catholic Church of the modernists, of the new bishops and the new priests, officially, however, says, officially, does not deny clearly and always the presence on, of the Blessed Sacrament on the altar and does not always say there is no sacrifice of Mass in the sense of forgiving the sins. The Pope, at least, still sticks to that. However, they make it manifest that they do not believe in the presence of the, uh, real, uh, in the real presence of our Lord on the altar. And I will give you one example to show you how intentions become manifest. In this case, intentions of the uh, American Bishops' Conference and Rome. It was a couple of Protestants and Catholics, Protestant and Catholics, who some 10 or 12 years ago signed an open letter to the Pope complaining about the fact that you can see wine stains in the wall-to-wall -wall carpet in Catholic churches right there where communion is distributed under both kinds, host and chalice. And they could see the wine stains in the bright gray wall-to-wall uh, -wall carpet. And they said, the Catholics said, we believe this is the blood of our Lord, how can you do this? And the Protestants said, you tell us this is the blood of our Lord, how can you do this? You know what the, what, what the answer of Rome was? The Sacred Congregation for the Liturgy signed a letter to the American Bishops' Conference, giving them plain faculty to decide to distribute communion under both kinds whenever they want. This is manifested intention not to confect the sacrament on the altar or to confect, much worse, a sacrilege. Here, Rome was officially endorsing the sacrilege or the symbol of communion where it doesn't matter if you spill a drop of wine or not because it's wine anyway it's symbolic wine so you can interpret Rome's answer either way and either way it does not correspond with the intention to do what the church does so you can see from these things that we at least have to have grave doubt about the validity of the new mass. The church throughout 2,000 years has explicitly over and over again outlawed the participation in a doubtful sacrament. 
the church has always decreed and commanded the faithful to stay away from doubtful ceremonies. And the church has never allowed anything but the safer course. As a matter of fact, when Innocent III, Pope Innocent III was asked if you could celebrate a certain, it was a question about a certain liturgical local custom, if you were allowed to use it, even though it put a question mark on the validity of the sacrament, but you should use it for pastoral purposes to attract more faithful, Innocent III answered, no. The safer course must always be adopted. You can never use for something as sacred as the sacrament anything doubtful. And if you do, you engrave sin and disobedience to the church. And this is the reason why a Catholic who wants to remain a Catholic must not participate in a new order mass. And I will explain this to you in detail because this concerns all of us in, in, in daily life. First of all, we are not allowed to participate in the new mass for the simple reason that the new mass is against, the, against divine law, as I have shown to you. How can you fulfill, I mean, this is absurd, how can you fulfill Sunday obligation by participating in something that is against divine law? It's ridiculous. Second, the church has always insisted on the safer course. How can you participate in something which is evidently a doubtful ceremony? Third, the church has always insisted that liturgy must correspond to the faith because the faith is based on liturgy. How can you participate in a ceremony that does not represent the Catholic faith? Read the New English Missal and read the Baltimore Catechism. Read what is said about Mass in the Baltimore Catechism and read the, uh, the Eucharistical prayers in the New English Missal, in your Sunday Missal of the New Mass. You will see that the uh, Baltimore Catechism talks about our Lord, the Trinity, talks about the sacrifice of cavalry, talks about the uh, sacrifice of uh, the propitiatory sacrifice. It talks about the real presence of the, of the body and the blood on the altar. The new missile talks about the poor people in prison, talks about the, tour, the poor disadvantaged, it talks about the people who are uh, 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 forgotten. It talks about man, 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 and man. Oh, excuse me, man and woman, man and woman, man and woman, man and woman. We want to be politically correct. It talks about uh, persons. The whole new liturgy is concerned with persons. Let's pray for this person, that this person may personalize, personalize herself more personal. It does not talk about the fact that we, that the purpose of our existence is the praise of the, of the Most Blessed Trinity. And it can, because all the prayers that mention the old doctrine have been left out in the new rite. And we will go through this at the end. The reason why, uh, you, I gave you the reason why you cannot be present, why you should not be and must not be attend a Novus Ordo Mass. However, there is one exception only. If uh, somebody in the family dies, if somebody in the family uh, marries, and you would upset the whole family, the whole, uh, as the Jews call it, Mushpacha, and uh, the whole clan, and the whole uh, dynasty, and then you may attend, but do not say Amen, because Amen in Hebrew does not mean, okay, it's all right. Amen in Hebrew means yes, yes, yes. And you don't want to say yes to a sacrilege. Why is it a sacrilege? Now, Mass, first of all, starts the, the real Mass, the Latin Mass, the Tridentine Mass, the Mass of all times, the Mass that most of all saints and popes ever celebrated. Mass starts with the, the mentioning of the altar. In Tribod Altare Dei, a priest approaches the altar. An altar is not a dining table. An altar, in the concept of the English language and all other languages throughout history, is the very place where you do a sacrifice. You place a sacrifice. The, uh, the priest in ancient Greece, when he was sacrificing different types of animals to uh, the Greek gods, Pallas Athena and all the others, he would not have dared to face the people instead of facing the, the statue of Pallas Athene in the Parthenon in Athens. 
he was an altar. On an altar, a sacrifice is uh, offered up, and not a dinner. So the, the concept of the altar had to go. Therefore, the Psalm 42 was left out already uh, by Paul VI before the, uh, the new Mass came up. Then you have the offertory. Uh, there cannot be a sacrifice without an offertory. You cannot, you cannot uh, in no religion ever throughout history, there was an, a sacrifice without an offertory, without a priest first picking up the lamb and saying, I offer this to you, our Lord, before he slaughtered the lamb, or whatever the animal was that had to be sacrificed. Even in those horrible pagan rites that fortunately were massacred, like the... Uh, the, the, uh, like, uh, the, car, car, what is it, Cart Cartago. Uh, they sacrificed babies to the Malak. They threw babies into the fire as an offering to God. Fortunately, this religion was massacred by the Romans. But, uh, or the Aztecs. The Aztecs offered up to 40,000 a day to the gods, cutting out the heart of the life prisoner. Now, somehow, those political correct people today never mention these facts. It's strange. However, even there, the priest would first take up the, uh, the stone dagger, say a prayer offering to one of the Aztec uh, gods, and before he carved out the heart of the prisoner. There was never a sacrifice in the history of a religion without an offertory until Paul VI came up with a new mass. This new mass does not speak anymore about the fact that the uh, sacrifice is presented to the Most Blessed Trinity. Sushi pe sancte trinitas is the prayer that you have to look up in your missal. Accept, O Holy Trinity, the sacrifice that I offer up. The new offertory, quote-unquote offertory, recites a Jewish dining, uh, dinner prayer. And uh, I do not know it by heart. I have never celebrated the Mass, thank God, in the vernacular. And... Uh, but it says, Blessed uh, is the Lord uh, fr uh, from whom we receive the bread, the fruit of uh, earth and human labor, which will, which will give to you so that it may become our spiritual bread. This is what the, uh, the Jewish patriarch would say before, they would, this is the way the Jewish patriarch would say grace at dinner. So using this offertory, quote unquote, in the new mass, you communicate the idea of a dinner, not a sacrifice. Later on, in the, in the Roman canon, for those few priests who use the Roman canon to celebrate Mass, the words of consecration have been changed. In the old days, it was hocus in corpus meum and nothing else. The Church had no intention of quoting St. Paul, literally. The Church was using uh, words that expressed the meaning of the sacrifice of Mass because the words of consecration are efficient words. It is the words of consecration in the right frame, of course, in the right intention and with the right matter, but it is the words of consecration that render present our Lord. The words of consecration are not a narration. They are not a report on what happened 2,000 years ago, but they are communicating what happens here, right now. And... Uh, these have been changed to a literal quotation from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Or is it the Romans? I don't remember. And uh, the words of the consecration of the chalice used to contain what you do not find in the letters of St. Paul or the Gospel, the word mysterium fide, mystery of faith. So the priest would say, I hate to translate it into English because a vernacular translation is almost a sacrilege to a sacred text, uh, especially in English, German and other rotten languages. Uh, use, the priest says, this is the chalice with my blood of the new and the uh, everlasting testament which is uh, given up uh, for you and for most, not for all, for most. And at that moment he says, mystery of faith. Because now the priest at the very moment of consecration professes his own faith in the real presence professes his own faith in the fact that here a sacrifice takes place and he professes his own faith in the fact that it is not he who is speaking. When I celebrate Mass, I say, this is my body. How is that possible? I do not offer up my body visibly. I'm still here. 
It is not me. It is not I who speaks, but it is our Lord who speaks. I'm just lending him my voice and my priesthood that I share with him that I have received from him. I'm lending him my voice, basically. He speaks through my mouth, which is why priests are to be considered sacred, by the way. So, at the very moment, our Lord is present fully, body and blood. I have to do an act of reverence. So I will immediately, I will say, mystery of faith. And very shortly after that, will genuflect. Long before I show the chalice or the host to the people, I will genuflect because the moment he is present at the altar, I have to do an act of reverence. How can I make it, how can I make it uh, plausible to you that I believe that this could become the blood of our Lord if at the moment it, it has become the blood of our Lord, I do not show any immediate reverence. Absurd. Absolutely absurd. And yet this is what the new Mass does. And I have mentioned the best of the best cases. The old Roman canon in Latin. Now, Paul VI added three so-called Eucharistical prayers, whatever that means, to uh, the Roman canon as an option. Now, I give you one example of, uh, of a real liturgical trash. The third Eucharistical prayer, significantly enough the one the present Pope prefers over all the others, the third Eucharistical prayer starts with saying, uh, we have come together here to offer up the... Sa uh, no, it says, Populum uh, congregare non desinis ut sacrificium, etc. You do not uh, cease to congregate the people so that the sacrifice may be offered up. What does that mean? That means the people have to come together so that Mass can be offered up? Does that mean the people have to come together we, uh, so in order that we celebrate Mass? The definition of Mass given, by the way, in the Roman Missal of 1969 and 1970, because you cannot add anything to a wrong definition, uh, you, have to, you have to take away a wrong definition. If you add other things to it, it doesn't make a change. So we have the definition still in there. The definition of Mass given in the Roman Missal of 1969, signed by Paul VI, is the following. The Mass or the, uh, uh, what's the term in English? The, the Mass or the, uh, it doesn't say sacrifice, the Mass or the Supper. The Mass or the, or the Supper of our Lord is when people come together and unite uh, under Christ to give praise and thanksgiving to Him. Now that's the definition of the Roman Missal. Where's the sacrifice for the forgiving of sins? Where's the propitiatory sacrifice? Where's the real presence? Where's the, uh, where's the sacrifice of, of, of our Lord on the, on the cross? And you know what? This definition, which you can read in the Missal of Paul VI, is almost to the letter the same definition that Archbishop Thomas Cranmer of Canterbury under Henry VIII gave to his Mass. And he called it the Mass or the Supper of the Lord. Exactly what the English Missal does now, with the only difference in spelling. In those days, Mass was spelled M-A-S-S-E. -S That's the only difference. So the new Mass, to call the new Mass a Protestant rite, is an insult of the Anglican, uh, 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 Anglican community because the new Mass goes far beyond that. The Anglican Mass at least still speaks about the fact that we have to have our sins forgiven. The Anglican Common Prayer Book speaks about the sacrifice of praise and the sacrifice of thanksgiving. The Novus Ordo Mass, the Novus Ordo Mass of Paul VI does not mention any type of sacrifice. The word sacrifice hardly ever appears in the whole Missal. It has been diligently scratched out of all the common prayers and all the, the proper prayers in the Missal. Now, I've mentioned the best case, the Roman Canon, and the Third Eucharistical Prayer, speaking about the uh, kind of presuming the presence of the people for the necess uh, as a necessity for celebrating Mass, is something that you could not call directly heretical, but definitely leading towards heresy. Because if you read that and hear that over and over again, you will come to the conclusion, ah, my presence is necessary for Mass. Well, rest assured it isn't. Very often I celebrate Mass entirely alone behind closed doors. And believe me, it's a valid Mass. And it's exactly as valid as a Mass with 2,000 people. And it is definitely more valid than the Novus Ordo Mass of the Cardinal Archbishop of New Orleans and his cathedral. And I don't care how many people are present. And it doesn't make a time worth of a difference if there is two 
uh, uh, devote, uh, devout old ladies present at Mass or 500,000 people when the Pope celebrates Mass. It doesn't make the slightest difference. We do not, uh, never has the, uh, has the presence of, of the people been needed for a sacrament. Only the one who receives the sacrament is needed for a sacrament if a recipient is needed. And in Mass that isn't the case because the communion of the faithful, strictly speaking, is not even a part of Mass. Only the communion of the priest is a necessary part of Mass. And uh, in addition to that, you have all the things that you will not find in the Missal itself. See, this is something very often, uh, people very often forget to talk about. The, uh, a liturgy does not just consist of the book that is used. Where is the book used? By whom is the book used? What book? When? How? What's the circumstances? The, the new missal is used in churches that I do not have to illustrate or describe to you. You have seen those hideous buildings. When you uh, drive through a beautiful old New England village with beautiful old uh, useless Protestant churches, the only hideous and ghastly building around is the new Catholic church. And uh, this new Catholic church does not have an altar anymore. A new law, a, a new law now uh, for, uh, commands the bishops to remove the high altar in the cathedral. That's a law. He has to put up what is called the altar of the, faith, uh, for the, uh, the altar of the faithful. Now just the word, altar of the faithful. Altar. Altar. It's called altar, but of the faithful. Versus the faithful. The altare versus populum. Which of course is a banquet table. Herr Dr. Martin Luther said, we have to do away with the altar and put up a table because on an altar you sacrifice, on a table you eat. Those are the words of Martin Luther. And that's the significance of a table. And those are the words of Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, the founder of the Anglican Rite. And when you listen to the prayers of the faithful in the Novus Order churches out there, you will find out that we are much, we are not belonging to them, but that the, the Novus Order church is much, much worse than the Lutherans or the Anglicans. Much worse. You go to an Episcopalian church in New York, there is no altar face, uh, face, facing the people. There is no altar of the faithful. And their, their, uh, their prayers of the faithful don't exist. There is no such thing as a procession of ridiculously dressed people who line up to say some totally insignificant prayers for some poor prisoners in Nicaragua. 